Okay, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me to present my work here. Um, I'm going to talk about our work on protein peptide interactions and how um, deep learning and AlphaFold has affected us. Um, before I start talking about what uh, I'm working on, I want to talk about who I am working with. So this is my lab, a wonderful lab of very, very talented and very nice people. Um, I'm mostly going to work, uh, talk about work by Alisa Khamushin, who is just now finishing her PhD and going on for a postdoc, and about work uh, by Tomer Saban, Yulia Varga, and Oli Avraham in the lab. So these are wonderful interactions between people learning interactions between proteins. So that's the way I like to see it. Okay, so um, I want to uh, talk about how we view, learn, and model peptide protein interactions. And uh, in a moment, I, it will become clearer and what we learned about this on the way in deep learn. Uh, proteins too can communicate and in a very similar fashion as people do using SMS, which is a short motif sequence for those of you who didn't know. So these short motif sequences are peptide motifs and they interact with uh, peptide dining domains. And they are very similar in terms of communication of what we are used to, at least, you know, our younger generation. Uh, communicating with very, very short messages that can be very easily understood if the context is known. So for people in the same context or for uh, interactions within a given context, these uh, short motifs are enough to provide a lot of information. But of course, if the context changes, the information can change. So our uh, group is interested in understanding, first of all, the basic principles that govern the interaction between this motif and the peptide binding domain, but also how we can use this to understand also what the context does to this interaction. And today I'm going to talk about one of the main projects that we are working on in the lab. Not the only one, but definitely the main one is basically uh, how we have developed different tools to model these interactions, in particular to try to understand um, which ways to go to understand more, to, uh, to every time step one step further. And so um, we have this local uh, Rosetta Flex PepTalk protocol that allows high resolution refinement of peptides bound to the proteins. And then I'll talk about uh, how to actually extend this to global docking with three very different approaches. Okay, so Rosetta Flex PepTalk uses the Rosetta framework in a way to target for targeted optimization of peptides by iterative optimization of the rigid body orientation of the peptide and the conformational uh, changes in the backbone um, using Monte Carlo optimization with minimization. And it does this in iterative cycles where we start with a very strong attractive turn and gradually re-ramp um, re up the repulsive turn to generate highly and tightly packed conformations. This protocol was developed um, with, uh, by uh, two very talented students that started with me in my new lab near London and Barakave. Today, they both have their own labs, uh, one at the Leitman Institute and the other in uh, Hebrew University in Computational Sciences. And so this protocol allows to start from some uh, nearby uh, conformation in red and to generate structures that are very near to the um, crystal crystallographically determined structure. And if we know less about the interaction, if you know only the binding side, we can start with some extended arbitrary conformation and use a more extended protocol that uses more intensive sampling uh, ab initio flex talk. And so this model has changed um, um, the way we look at protein protein docking uh, significantly. People have started to work also on peptide docking and we even have published a book a couple of years ago with all the different protocols that have been developed. So it's interesting to see how many different approaches address the same problem and every time uh, solve another challenge within that uh, problem set. The uh, interesting thing is that we can generate structures that um, localize uh, the hotspot residues very accurately, but uh, often with very different backbone structures, which shows the utility of this protocol of finding the con correct conformation with uh, extensive but um, very uh, accurate sampling. So this is nice. And it has an impact. One of the examples that we can, uh, uh, that we have been starting to look at now is to look at modeling of interactions of peptides that have been modified by post translation modification and have been found to be bound to MHCs. So in a collaboration with uh, Yifat Merbel, with the Yifat Merbel lab that um, did an immunopeptidome immunopeptidome analysis, a very large scale analysis. 
and found many um, peptides that changed their MHC uh, preferences based on post translation modifications, we provided the backup that basically tells them how these new interactions can be identified or understood. Since for protein, uh, post translation modifications, we don't have these sequence databases, we needed to go to the structural basis to understand how this works. For example, HLA-A2, some of you will remember, they have uh, the, this MHC has a hydrophobic uh, motif to bind to peptides. And here you have a peptide with a lysine that binds to this HLA-A2 because of its acetylation. And we can see that when we generate those models, the scores for the modified peptide are much higher than for the unmodified peptide, providing the structural um, um, pro, uh, uh, basis of what they actually found in the experiment. And this is also the starting point for machine learning, of course. So, but there is also a challenge. It's accurate, but slow. Um, it's restricted to the peptide in terms of flexibility and the binding site must be known. So we banged our head for a long time of how to actually make this global because this protocol is nice and accurate, but it's very, very slow. It's really, really slow. It takes so much time. And so we have come up with three different ways of looking at this. And this is based on the uh, observation that peptide binding complements monomer structure in a term in the sense that if you look at the monomer structure, you could in principle look at peptide protein interaction also as a globular monomer structure. So maybe we can use similar concepts that are used in protein modeling for peptide protein interactions in a more global, um, larger sense. So we have looked at three different ways to do this, and I will tell you about the three. Okay, the first one uh, is uh, looking from the peptide side. So we're going to look at the interaction from different point of views. Now we're going to start from the peptide side of view. So what does the peptide do when it binds to the receptor? And so this first protocol was developed already quite a while ago. That was our first protocol for global docking. It was developed, spearheaded by Nausa Dalam, who is now a postdoc in, um, in Oxford. Um, so in that case, we are looking at the peptide uh, as, from the peptide side and say, okay, can we learn something about the peptide conformation, even though we know that peptides don't adopt defined conformations before they bind? So we started from the observation, which is pretty trivial, but think about it. When we look at peptides, they often bind with a sequence motif that is conserved. So if there is a conserved sequence motif, for example, here is a list of different domains binding to different sequence motifs collected in N. So maybe this has a common structural motif. Sounds trivial, right? That, that is something that we all agree upon. This conserved structural motif basically is a dip in this energy landscape, a preferred structural motif for that peptide in the bound conformation. So the question is, can we actually also see this peptide conformation in the free conformation of the peptide. And you will all say no, because we know that when we do NMR or so and other techniques, we will almost never see a defined uh, structure of the peptide. But maybe in this ensemble of conformation, there is at least, at least a tiny fraction that does adopt this conformation. And if so, can we maybe use this for modeling? And so if you think about this, it's very, very similar to what we do with Rosetta, with the very, very, very early Rosetta protocol. What was the early Rosetta protocol all about that actually was the first time to allow for ab initio modeling? It was simply a reduction of the local conformational space. And by selecting fragments that represent local sequence preferences, we could basically reduce the conformational space that we sample to a combination of fragments instead of looking at all the five psych combinations. And so, in this way, basically, we do take these fragments, we combine them with a global optimization um, search to generate global-like uh, properties. And then we refine this with some high-resolution atomic uh, resolution model. So let's do the same for peptides. And that's what we did. So basically, we, take, uh, we use the fragment picker to generate a library of peptide fragments. And then we take each and each and every of these peptide fragments that are similar in terms of sequence and predicted secondary structure extracted from monomers. We take these peptides and we dock them exhaustively, but quickly onto a protein receptor, which is uh, what we do with Piper, using Piper, which is, has been developed by uh, my a long time colleague, um, Dima Kozakov. It's a very efficient and very accurate um, protocol for docking. And then we refine this using our protocol, Rosetta FlexFed Dock. And actually this works pretty well. So here is just an example, an example case where we see the ensemble of fragments that we generate using the fragment picker, 
colored by the similarity to the actual uh, peptide conformation. You can see that in dark blue are the ones that are similar, in yellow are the ones that are um, less similar, but it uh, samples a range of conformations, including the good ones. We dock these using Piper. Each and every of these peptides we dock and sample the whole conformation uh, across the receptor. And then we get an energy landscape where we would like to have um, among the low energy conformations, low RMSD conformations. We are not going to be able to identify the conformation here that is correct because it's not an accurate structure, it's rigid body. But we can already identify those that we want to follow up with, which we are going to refine with flex step doc. And here we can see that we get already a funnel and a low energy conformation that we can select, which will be very, very accurate. And so this protocol works pretty well. So the way I'm showing the performance is um, in a graph that shows a certain RMSD cutoff for peptide uh, backbone RMSD, and the number of complexes or the fraction of complexes that can be modeled within this RMSD. So you can see that, for example, in this case, 35% of the complexes in this data set of 26 peptide protein complexes can be modeled within two angstrom RMSD, which is a global docking protocol, and which is very, very impressive, something like that wasn't available before. And indeed, uh, all, even with, in comparison with other protocols that have been developed since then um, or around the same time, it's really performing pretty well. Okay, but what happens if we have no good peptides fragments? You can think about if the peptide gets a bit longer, maybe we don't get any. Or also, what happens if the receptor changes? We are doing rigid body docking, so this is not going to work. So now we need to think again. And now I'm going to talk about two things that, uh, two studies that we have really finished up in the last year. So these are very new things and very exciting things. So I'll be happy also to hear feedback. So, okay. So instead of looking now at the interaction from the side of the peptide, let's start and look at from, from the side of the receptor. So that's what uh, Alisa did with the Patchman protocol. And so let's see if we can, uh, how far we can get with this type of approach. Okay. So, Again, the, observ the second observation that we found uh, useful for um, our conceptual thinking is that nature reduces its building blocks. So this is again from the study from Van Hee from the Serrano lab. Um, it's uh, two examples um, of a peptide protein interaction and a monomer that look really, really the same in a local region, even though the global region doesn't look at all the same. So the context is important. What this basically means is that if I know the receptor, maybe I can actually define the peptide conformation. And so the idea would be to take the receptor surface and look for complementary fragments, identified in matching uh, samples in uh, monomers or wherever I can find them. So the idea is following. So this is called patch motif alignment, patchment. So we are going to go over each and every surface residue and identify a local patch that includes the nearby residues. So we have now local motifs, and these local motifs, we're going to try to find these local motifs in a data set of protein structures, which includes both interfaces and uh, monomers, whatever was available in a data set in 2014, I think, um, generated by Gevok Gevorian, and go into details in a moment. And let's say here we find, for example, this motif, we will find it here in this monomer structure. And what we can now do is can extract the template, uh, a template for the peptide as a starting point for our docking protocol that we are going to use for refinement after we replace a sequence to what we had before. So will this protocol work at all? That's the question. It works very well. So when we look at here, this is the graph that I showed you before. This is a performance of Patchman. It works even better than part of step doc. Um, how does it work? What are the details? How do we actually make this work? So the first part involves how to split the surface. So this is not trivial. We need to think about how to do this in a way so we can actually identify, we will be specific enough. So we will, the number of hits will be tractable. We will not have too many hits, but we need to be close enough so to allow for conformational changes. So for example, if you are looking at this residue here, and if you want to identify the surface patch, we're going to extend it into the, into the region, but we're going to now to look for matches that are not only exactly this uh, patch, but also things that are almost similar. And so let's go to the next step. Once we have those patches, let's go and see how we find them in the, in the set of protein structures. 
we use for this master, which is a very, very, very um, fast and efficient protocol to identify local matches very quickly by looking for segments, by just gradually looking for each and every segment if we, if we can match the protein structure. And so once we have this uh, structure, we need to extract this peptide template and move it to the receptor. So again, we need to have some guidelines of how to do this. So we define some uh, distance cutoff. We look for each and every residues that are around this um, patch. And we look for contiguous segments that we can extend into both directions. And this will be the starting point and to show you, this is a very, very uh, good protocol. Uh, the reason why it's very, very extensive is because we are not looking at the sequence at all. So here we are only looking from the receptor side where peptides would bind, but without any restrictions on peptide sequence and also on structural sequence of the receptor. And that allows us to sample the, the surface very, very intensively. And then we can use next step talk to refine each and every of those conformations to obtain high resolution models and select the ones that work best. So we can ask many interesting questions. First of all, you will tell me, okay, of course this will work because I will find um, homolog templates in the database. I can take just structures of similar protein uh, peptide receptor structures and just copy them. Of course I can do that. But the question is, what do I do if I don't have these types of templates? And maybe the question is more general. Can I use monomers for this? And so what we are doing here, we are going to look at uh, energy landscape and we are going to extract for each and every of those energy landscapes, the top scoring models, 1%, that are also, and then among those, only the ones that are within five angstrom. And we're going to look at what, what they look like. So in this case, as I tell you already, I can also tell you, already tell you, many of them are actually extracted from monomers. They come from monomers, they don't come from interfaces. So we can use monomers indeed to uh, generate peptide protein interactions, which again reinforces our uh, vision of a peptide being part of a monomer. And if you look at the sequence identities of those, pet, of those sequence templates, again, they are mostly non-identical at all or very, very low identity. So it's really only the structure that we are looking at and that provides a very strong and large basis. Moreover, it, of, of course, we can all already think about what this can actually mean for design. We can use this for design for new, new interactions. And so, for example, this is an, just an example of a non-trivial conformation. This is the heat that we find as a monomer. And then when we look at it, this is, if we would use pipoflex step dock, this would not work because in that case, we don't have a fragment that actually fits. You can see all the fragments that we extracted using pipoflex step dock were above two angstroms. So they didn't work. But in this case, we can get a very nice hit and we get very good structures. Uh, if we look at them, these are the top 10 structures that we get. Most of them, even if they have high RMSD values, the per residue RMSD is very low for the motif region of the protein and for this la uh, last helix it changes a bit. So this works very well. And indeed, pattern is very uh, less, is much, much less sensitive to motif definition than, and peptide length. Here you can see the performance of pipoflex pet doc for um, structures where we have the full peptide or if we model only the motif. And you can see the dramatic differences Whereas in Patchman, this doesn't really make a difference because we extract the whole template from the structure uh, of the tem template structure at all. Okay, and the last thing that I want to say is that we can model conformational changes. This is also very exciting because this opens up the door to many additional new um, applications. Um, so this is an example of a protein that we have studied for a long time together with Ilva uh, Iverson. Um, this is the firm domain of Moesin. And Ilva Iverson has uh, identified many different templates using trade sheets base, and we wanted to model where they bind. Now, it turns out that this protein has different binding sites. There is a binding site here called FCA. And when this binding site is bound, FCB closes. There is some allosteric communication between the two. And now, if you use the closed structure, the unbound structure, um, with type of flex talk, you can't identify any peptides here because this is a binding site because it's just closed. There is no place for a peptide. But if you use a, a patchman, you can find templates here. Of course, if you then use these templates and optimize them without minimization, again, you won't get low energy conformations because there is no room here. But if you allow the receptor to relax with minimization of the backbone, you can see that you can get a very good um, uh, conformation. And that is really important because there are many interactions that work with this type of um, uh, or organization where you have a closed site where you could actually open it once you have the peptide there. And you can identify the location of the peptide using this patchman approach. 
And here is an example that we can't solve with Touchman. I just wanted to show also one that we can't solve. So this is an example of a protein that has been solved with a tetrapeptide, like really in the center of the protein. Touchman doesn't identify this at all. And of course, we are all, all understand why. And so this is an example that shows that in many cases, we might need some other protocol that actually really folds the protein together with the peptide. And that's where we go to the third chart. Any questions until here? It's okay. Can I continue? Okay. So the third part is um, what we did with uh, alpha fold. And um, um, so again, so the hypothesis here is that the peptide complements the receptor to form a global monomer structure. And so the idea of Thomas was that if this is true, we could in principle take the sequence of a protein, uh, add a polyglycine linker, and then the peptide, and then fold it as a monomer. And indeed, this is what people in experiments do, right? If you want to solve the structure of a peptide protein interaction of an interaction that is very low affinity, you just connect it with the glycine linker, and then it's, uh, the local uh, concentration is higher, and then you have an increased chance of solving that protein structure. But uh, we try to do this with, um, uh, in, deep, in silico, and we failed miserably. It's really, it was really frustrating. So Tomo worked on this for quite a few months, and it just never worked. And the reason why it didn't work is because Protocols such as Tia Rosetta and Rosetta Fold just don't understand that polyglycines don't fold. They don't understand the polyglycine code. So it just, just didn't work out. And also, we saw a paper by Arne Elofsson that reported the same thing, the same idea for domain domain interaction. It just didn't work. But then uh, Alpha Fold was um, released, and the code was made available in mid July. And so we immediately thought, okay, well, let's try Alpha Fold. And we thought about this more because. Alpha fold was shown in a, uh, in a study that actually Fabio Beltrao gave one of the talks last, last, last talk in your seminar. So he was one of the people in this uh, study where they looked at what alpha fold can do and what it cannot do. And they showed in a very, very surprising way that the percentage of regions of unstructured regions that alpha fold can identify is much, much higher than any other protocol. Even a protocol that has been optimized for years, IUPRED2, that have been optimized for years for identifying unstructured regions. So if we thought that if AlphaFold can identify unstructured regions, it maybe knows to read the polyglycine code. And so that's why we started to look at this. And this is actually really nice. So it worked. So we evaluated this protocol on an initial set that we talked about before, which contains 14 cases where we know the motif and 12 cases where there is no motif of the peptide known. And we applied it to a large set that we calibrated um, that, that, that we put together, especially for this study. And in this set, we made sure that the interaction, that each and every interaction involves a different E code domain. So it's very non redundant. And each and every of these interactions were validated not to contain crystal contacts and things that we would actually make it less um, natural. And so, what we get here are two examples of what we can get. This is an example of a success. You can see that AlphaFold nicely understands that polyglycine is just here for fun, and it puts the peptide in a very accurate position in the binding site. This is an example where it fails, and here we know why it fails, because it just doesn't understand what it needs to do. So it's nice to know that when you succeed, you succeed, and when you fail, you know that you have failed. It saves a lot of time. So let's look at it in a more general way. So this is the, the application to the whole data set. I'm going to show the overall results, and then I'm going to ask some interesting questions that we can look at um, in more details using this protocol. Okay, so what we are showing here is the structure of the peptide and the structure of the receptor. So again, this is the same cumulative plot. We have, let's say, for example, we have here 75% of the, of the cases in the uh, motif set are uh, the, 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 recept the peptide structure is uh, modeled within three angstrom full atom model. Um, in, so basically this is, just to show you that it does know how to fold the peptide and fold the receptor. But what we are interested in is not this. We are interested in to see how, we, how well does it do for interface to model the peptide interface, both the peptide and the receptor. And these are the results for the different data sets. So the red one is the motif data set, the, the, the non-motif data set, the blue one is the motif data set, the yellow is the uh, um, low, large non-redundant set, and it's, for, um, it's compared to the performance of hyperflexion blocks. So what we can see here is that alpha fold works really well. So it's basically 
it's working very good for very 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 good for motif uh, mediated interactions and it works also pretty well for the rest so we can see that um, among the interactions 90 between 90 and 40 percent of the residues of the cases are modeled within 2.5 angstrom rmsd peptide interface residues uh, interface rmsd so that is very good and this happens despite complete lack of peptide MSA coverage. So there is no multiple sequence alignment for the peptide here. So this already indicates that there must be something else going on. So it's not multiple sequence information or coevolution information as, um, as what is, has been um, claimed to lead to these good performances of protein folding. And also um, we just here to show, we did a few very, very, very short um, optimization we found, for example, that we need more recycling than what was the default value. And we also found that we can combine uh, one case where we use this linker with polyglycine or we use separate chains. You can see that the, the performance is not the same. So in some cases, separate chains function. In some cases, the linker functions. So if you take both of them together, we get most of the interactions right. So but what was actually learned? So it's the question is really weird to see that this works, even though AlphaFold has never seen uh, multimer interactions, it has only seen monomers. So one of the things that we saw is that motifs are well predicted. When we look at this motif set, this is um, the first thing we see the prediction, the RMST. So low RMST is uh, white, high RMST is green. And the TLDDT, the prediction of the local distance. Um, so basically what we show, see here is that PLDDT is a very good proxy. It identifies the motifs and where the low RMSD regions are. In the non-motif sets, performance is a little bit less good, but we have also cases in the non-motif sets where we, it works. Again, PLDTT shows pretty good correlation. But so what makes motifs special? That's one thing that we need to think about. Um, when we look at the residue level, we can see indeed that the motif residues are mod modeled with um, very high PLDTT at low uh, RMSD. And basically what it means is that um, we can identify the largest, the, the, the largest part of the residues can be identified based on this uh, PLDDT value. If it's above 0.7, then we get the high resolution structures. And the models are also very useful. What I show you here is a very simple Rosetta alanine scanning, first done on the crystal structure, and then done on the model that we generated. And what we see here are the uh, RMSD values, the, the delta delta G values that are predicted for the crystal structure, based on the crystal structure, based on the model. And so you can see that there is a pretty good correlation, particularly for the ones that are well modeled. Of course, the ones that are badly modeled, we don't understand what happens there. But for the ones that are well modeled, this is for the peptide, we have many, many true positives and only few false uh, positives and negatives. And this is also true for the receptor to a less degree, but also, and also for the peptide uh, motif and non-motif regions, not only for the large non-redundant sets. So this basically tells us that we should be able to identify at a large scale new slim motifs. Because if we dock the peptides and we identify the regions that are important, we can identify new motifs, new ends, new interactions. And that we are working on this right now. The other thing that is really interesting is that we can model conformational changes. Remember that case where we said that we can't do this without folding of the peptide together? So here we can actually really see how uh, conformations will um, change upon binding and alpha fold succeeds in modeling them. We are here two examples. The blue one is the uh, uh, unbound conformation and the green one is the bound conformation. And you can see that in the green one, the peptide, uh, in this case, the peptide occupies the same site as uh, some part of the protein. And in this case, this, uh, this, um, this um, beta hairpin moves up. And you can see that in both cases, alpha fold succeeds very nicely in modeling those structures. And this is very uh, surprising to me. Um, the question that we want to ask is, did it learn these conformational changes? Did, does it always predict the bound conformation of the, pep of the protein? Can we use this for dynamics or not? And there are some studies that have started to look at this. Um, to diversify the predictions that AlphaFold generated, generates to actually um, identify more conformational changes. But the fact that it predicts this bound conformation is intriguing to me. Memorization. Does uh, mem uh, 
as of all learned or does it memorize? So one of the things that we thought that might be the reason why this works so well is maybe we have fusion proteins in the data set. We don't have monomers and we don't have interactions in the data set that AlphaFold um, trained for, but there might be fusion proteins that contain, as I said, this polyglycine linker. But in these two cases, you can see that in some cases it is used, but in most of the cases, the templates are not used and are um, perform performing well, even if templates are available or not. So this is not really more uh, memorization, it's much more than that. Um, another thing is that um, post translation modifications don't really affect this uh, performance, which is weird. So basically, this means that it doesn't model really what it should model because. If this is the performance of the large non redundant set, we took a set, uh, a subset of interactions where there are post translation modifications or ligands found, and it works pretty much the same. So, is this a bug or a feature, or can we predict context based on cavities in models? And there have been people that have been looking at alpha field or something, alpha field that actually identify those regions. These are things that we still need to think about. Okay, so if we uh, compare all the three, they all work pretty well. Um, especially for motifs and alpha fold is much, much faster. So if you want to uh, start with some, some prediction, you should, alpha, you, should alpha, you should use alpha fold and then continue with the other protocols that we have because they are much slower. Um, they are also uh, complementary. So not everything that works in alpha fold will work with, for example, patchfold, and not everything that works with patchfold vice versa will work with alpha fold. Most of the interactions can be ca catched, caught by one of the three uh, performances. Okay, so to summarize, we have this deep learning that we are using for structure prediction. How can we harness this for peptide protein interactions? So I told you we looked at different strategies for blind peptide docking um, that we can learn. We can we use the uh, um, AI revolution in a very simple way, but we can use it in many other ways that we are exploring now. Um, and we can also use uh, our protocol in turn to validate what actually protocols like AlphaFold learn. Is it learning versus memorization? Is it peptide docking as validation? Uh, or, or we can use peptide docking as validation um, because these structures are not, are not in the training set. Okay, so to summarize, um, many lead, roads lead to Rome, or you need to take different perspectives to obtain the full picture. That's what we learned from our study. But you should walk fast. These things maybe need sometimes need to go fast because um, when the alpha code, code, code was um, re re released, we did this uh, per, um, analysis within two or three weeks, so we could actually get this out very fast and um, have an impact for this. Um, we learned about different features of the peptide protein interactions. We learned that the peptides apparently do sample conformation in three states that are bound, the bound conformation. And that's why we can use this type of exit door protocol. And we learned that the surface actually dictates the peptide conformation uh, by this patchment protocol. And also that monomer folding apparently really catches very similar things as peptide protein docking. I want to claim that this is all true for interactions that can, can be crystallized and uh, that are very nice that generate one stable conformation. But of course, many of the peptide mediated interactions are not this type of interaction. They will never be crystallized. And the question really that, that begs for asking is, can we use these protocols for any interaction? What will we need to do to actually extend this, to look at interactions in a much more global, broader way, where this type of paradigm that uh, binding uh, structure and then study uh, will break down. But what I feel is that we have, yes, mapped out the space of those interactions that do form these types of interactions, where the peptide sample, uh, samples a defined conformation in a way that it can actually uh, adopt it very quickly when it finds to its partner. So what next? Uh, we are enjoying, enjoying and learning a lot from the deluge of uh, new deep learning approaches and ideas. Every day there are new ideas. And it's really, really, I, I really enjoy this time. It's really, really rewarding. and. Um, stimulating and everything is really good. Um, we are working on an optimized, of course, we are working on optimizing our docking pipeline and learning a, a bit improved learning of scoring to make the protocol faster. We want to um, gener in a larger scale uh, characterize motif domain interactions. Interactions. This is in collaboration with Norman Davies. Um, 
both for L interactions where the motif is already known, but, but also for interactions where we might have information from page display, like that, those from Ilva, Iverson's lab, to identify uh, structural motifs uh, beyond sequence motifs. And we are working on learning specificity by combining structure and sequence information and deep learning, including the post translation modifications. And of course, Patchman as a starting point for many new things and design. And these are our servers. And okay, thank you. Well, you didn't ask questions. I, I'm done very quickly. So well, now you can ask questions. <laughs> thank you very much, Aura. That was really, that's really like very nice to see all this, this leap forward in protein peptide prediction. Um, yeah, that, that's that's very exciting. So is, is there any questions from any question from the audience? You can use the chat or just raise your hand and then and go and ask your question. Okay, so maybe I'll start to to warm, warm everybody up. Um, yeah, so so regarding so 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 what you, you showed us is that really the um the, the structure of the of the compatibility between the sequence and structure in the peptide is is really important so i was i was wondering so i guess with the tools you showed us if a peptide has intrinsically like is intrinsically less structured and more flexible i guess you'll have to to put in much more computational power to to make the prediction um and then yeah. Regarding the, the natural. I'm not sure if this is true. That's the point. Okay. That's the point because, I, of course, if it has, if it's not, I think the point is that if we want to predict the structure, that is going to be feasible. But the problem is that I assume that in the interactions, in many interactions that are relevant, there will not be one such structure. I mean, when you hear, for example, studies by Birte Kragelund or, or Den Schuller, where they do um, these experiments with unstructured regions. These interactions are high affinity, but they don't adopt one defined structure. So I think mm. that will be the challenge. But I think yeah. if the peptide has um, many conformations, it, it, if, if it has, let's say, if it has different sites and it adopts different conformations at different sites, I think we should be able to catch those conformations with at least one of those protocols. The problem is that how do you generate a, 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 a picture of a composite binding scenario where you don't have one structure? You have many, many different conformations that together generate the binding feature. That's, I think, the problem. Sorry, sorry. Did that answer your question? Or yes, yes. That's uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I see that um, Thomas and Shoshana have a question. Perhaps uh, Thomas, uh, yeah, if, if you can, do you, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Thank you very much. Really great talk. My question is about the the alpha four two uh, results. So mm -hmm. you mentioned that the multiple sequence sequence alignment generated for the peptide is not very much important. That's not where the signal comes from. Not coevolutionary signals or uh, similar signals that are picked up. But did did I get it correctly? Yeah. But then then you also said that motifs are special in somewhat somewhat some special way uh, in comparison to non motive interactions of peptides but then it made me think that how we annotate motifs in elm is basically definition by also conservation and evolutionary information um, can you comment on this that maybe multiple sequence alignments are has to be special somehow yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, I'm not sure if my answer is the correct one. I'll tell you what I think. I think this is a very, very important question to ask. And I think our setup is one of is one that allows to ask this question in a very uh, focused way. Um, so one way to answer this question is, first of all, that I think that um, the motif that is formed by the peptide is something that might be caught in the later steps of the alpha fold protocol, when they look at the local structural, you know, the local in the structural form, not in the ever form. So in the beginning, alpha fold is using expensive optimization of the multiple sequence alignments to identify co-evolving residues and co-evolving um, orientations and so on. And in that region, in that step, it might not catch these types of interactions because you, you do have, you do know, for example, that the motif is conserved. 
but you don't have any coevolution information. So it's fully conserved. It's not that it's changing, you know, that there is a coevolution between different residues. First of all, it's not what's happening. And second, we don't have this information because we don't have paired alignments. So, so the, there are two problems. The problem is that the peptide is very short. So to get a significant alignment for the peptide, you need very high sequence identity. Because if not, it's not significant because it's too short. And so if you need very high sequence identity, you will never get a deep alignment. Deep enough to identify evolutionary conservation in a sense where you can do coevolution. And moreover, you don't know the pairing between the peptide and the actual receptor. Because in many cases, it's not, you know, that you have one autolog in that organism and one autolog in that organism. It's not this. So together, I think there is no evolution, no coevolution information to actually try to see where that peptide could bind. What I think, yes, is there, is that you have some structural motifs that have been already learned. It, it must be that peptides that bind in this way, they occupy a restricted set of conformations. That's the way I see it. I, it doesn't sound logic to me that there will be like an infinite number of different conformations that can adopt this type of binding. And so if this is a restricted set of conformation, I would assume that in this second step of the, of the alpha fold protocol, where you have these um, local structural motifs that they actually fit together, there it will work. And the, the fact is that you need to do many recycles to get this done is maybe also hinting at this, that with the recycling, you do get some such types of um, orientations that the, then when you reinforce them, it might um, pick up the right uh, signal. Does that so, answer your question? So, yes, I think. Uh, do you then also can basically um, reformulate it in a way that the motives, they must have a more restricted structure than non-motive peptide interaction? That's what I think. I mean, yeah. that's mm -hmm. what... That's what I think. I mean, the way to do this, and we need to go more deeply into this, we haven't done this yet in a rigorous way. The way to do this is to look at um, conformations, at receptors that are known to bind in two different conformations. So for example, if you have uh, different structural motifs that maybe correspond to different sequence motifs or not, look at these examples and look what happens there. Mm -hmm. And we haven't done that. This is more complex to do. We need to do this, but we haven't done that yet. And, and also that you mentioned that probably not coevolution, but do you think there could be some kind of an other information encoded in the multiple sequence alignment? I just don't see how, because I don't have the paired alignment. So I can't look at conservation of the motif mm -hmm. and I can say, okay, this is a conserved motif. I, need, I, 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 I will apparently find some structural motif, but to find, and, and we, we show that we can find the structural motifs of the peptide, but to find the orientation between the two, I don't think there is information about this. Um, but of course, if we say that these are all structures that are represented by monomers, we could think, you know, that they could um, be learned by alignment of these motifs to those monomer structures at some point and provide the signal. But this is only in that specific case. And that's why I think we need the recycling. I don't know. You know, I'm not, I, I don't know. Maybe if you have other ideas, I'll be happy to hear. Not at the moment, unfortunately. Thank you. Okay. So I had I also had a question, actually not a question, but you know, it made me think that you know the local local sequence is really important in you know kind of in imparting the local structure. So you know that's something we showed many, many years ago that you know the the local structuring along the chain is uh, very very dependent on the local sequence so it would be interesting you know to really look at that you know see in terms of local structuring you know in terms of the local structure propensity how is that you know how how do these motifs fare compared to other regions where they you know they are embedded in in non-motif you know uh, yes. sequences so this, I mean, it's really, it, we showed many years ago that local structural motifs really de define the early, early folding intermediates, early mm -hmm. folding regions, and some of them are very small. So they are actually regions that are, you know, really defined by the local, local interactions and not by, by, you know, by long range interactions. So if you can independently look along the chain, which are these regions and see, sometimes you can get regions that form 
local structures, you know, in, in a, it doesn't, even if, even if it's populated only to 10% or 15%, it's enough. Exactly. And that's Alastairy, right? You know, 15, exactly. 15% it's enough. And if you have a, you know, a lo local concentration high enough of, of a binding partner, you'll get it. You know, you'll get the binding. So to see if other regions that are not known as being, you know, to be motifs also behave this way. And then you can kind of see what's special about the motifs. That's a very good, um, good uh, question. So this relates to the first protocol, to type of text bedrock. We have looked at this a little bit, but I don't remember the exact time. We, look to, we need to look at this in a large scale. So the idea that I had is to look at the information content or the, 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 the variability of the ensemble of the fragments that we sample all along the protein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you could basically see if this is a region in the, in the protein from which the peptide was cut out. If this is a region where you have suddenly very, very low divergence in the fragments. Mm -hmm. The point here is that it's a little bit um, like this because we are dividing, de de deriving the fragments based on the sequence alignment. So if you have a conserved region in the sequence alignment, you will get a restricted number of fragments. If you have um, a weak of sequence alignment, you will get more fragments. So to deconvolute these two features, I need to think about more how to do this. Yeah, but that's what we did also many, many yeah. years ago in terms of looking, looking at, at recurrent structural motifs irrespective of the sequence, and then you get the motif out. You know, right. from these superimposed right. structures, and then right. you you can see the 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 actual you know <laughs> what 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 matches or not. Yeah, definitely. And then we can also we could also look at uh, whether this reproduces Elm just by yeah. looking at yeah. the structure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. Yes. I don't think it's enough, but I I, I haven't. It could. I don't it have could the data. Give you an idea. It could give you an idea yeah. of what you know what nice. what is being learned. Nice. This is a nice idea. Thanks. Thank you, Wim. I think you raising, you're raising your, your hand. Yes, okay. I did indeed. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Like, uh, I, I've always liked peptides. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, especially that you work on, on PTMs, because it's something that's, you know, too often still ignored, I think, yeah, you know, given the, the role they play. I have like sort of a more broad contextual question for you. So on the one hand, you have like, you know, with AlphaFold 2, you're using like super detailed x-ray in vitro information for like, you know, interactions between proteins, proteins, peptides, proteins. And on the other hand, you have the evolutionary information, which is like, you know, time scales that we cannot even really imagine. Um, but obviously what's going on in vivo in the cell is like, you know, much more dynamic and somewhere in between, I guess it's, you know, it, it, it has a bit of both in it. Where do you see that going with respect to, to the methodology that you have? Yeah. Yes, so that's, I think that's a critical question. Um, dynamics, there have been some um, attempts to, you know, to, to modify AlphaFold and other protocols to get more dynamics. But this is really baby steps yet. Um, um, I'm not sure, you know, this, this is really a question that we need to, to, to study much more in detail. I don't have an answer for that, but it definitely it's not at the step where we can characterize dynamics using AlphaFold models. We are not at that step at all. And uh -huh. using our protocols, we have seen some uh, abilities to, to look at dynamics, but it's also restricted. I, I don't think that is something that is solved. So the way to go would be um, to look at, um, at examples where you have many different conformations and to see you know how many of those can be sampled using different approaches. Um, I'm especially interested in those that um, basically change based on peptide binding. For example, this Moisin case is very, very interesting because there is some, seems to be some allosteric between two different sites that actually influence. It's like an integrator of information. One can bind, the other cannot bind. And we, you need to understand dynamics there and we, we are not there yet. The only thing that we could find there is that we can, with our protocols, um, model both the open and the closed conformation and I and understand what can bind when it's open and when it's closed, but we are not much farther than that. If you have suggestions, I'd be happy to hear. Yeah, no, no, I mean, it's already great if you can model different conformations, I think, on, on the, you know, like the open and closed, that's, that's already, I think, a great step forward. Yeah, no, what we are working on, essentially, or, or now at least trying to do is, is to uh, connect it to information from proteomics mass spec experiments as much as possible, because there is information in there about what your proteins or peptides are doing, you know, indirectly in encoded in terms of like where you might find PTMs or, or you know, ah, okay. where, where in terms of where other 
signals might be present, you can map that back, of course, on the... Well, that uh, is very interesting. Yes, I would yeah. be... Send me an email about this. I would really be happy to hear about this. Okay, I was still trying to get money. But <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that will work. Yeah, Ideas don't cost I will. money. Yeah. I, I will... I'll send you an email. Yeah. So that is very interesting. Yes. I have, another, I have another question, Aura. Um, I'm, it, I found your your alanin scanning experiments uh, very exciting because I, I've I've always wondered about like contributions of the of hotspot residue versus like structure structure and residues like I don't know prolines or glycines that that really define the the yeah the, the the structure sequence compatibility of the of the bond conformation in binding. So I was wondering what is your take on that? Um, um, I'm not sure if I understand the question exactly. So what we did is we took the model and we took the mm -hmm. crystal structure and we did this very, very simple RNA scanning protocol mm -hmm. the time developed like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I can't believe it. It's 20 years ago and it's still working among the best. But just one, you take one and then you see what happens because you can't really predict um, mutations with alpha fold. Mm -hmm. What you can do, you can generate a structure and then you can basically use other protocols to see what happens with mutations. Mm -hmm. So, and then we see that the structures are accurate enough to be used just as crystal structures. That was the idea here mm -hmm. to see mm -hmm. what can we use them for. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if I, oh, you know, there, there, I think I remember in one of the CAPRI meetings, people were discussing, you know, what you take as a cutoff of success is very defines really what you develop. Mm -hmm. And you need to think of, so what do you want to do with your structure? So mm -hmm. what do you need it? And if you need it just to, you know, to identify the hotspots, then it's good enough. It, now it's one angstrom, it's two angstrom, you know, it could be, I like when it's one angstrom, but you know, mm -hmm. this is just like an aesthetic thing. It's not, you know, mm -hmm. if you really need it for, so that's what I wanted to say, but I didn't understand your question. Can you ask yeah. it again? No, I'm, I'm just, I, I've always wondered, like, in terms of, I mean, I guess, so, so what you're really showing is that, you have some structured structure sequence compatibility between like encoded in the in, in your in your motif so i was wondering like in terms of like the, perhaps the mutations that you will find in in nature that uh that um affect peptide binding do they ah. usually affect um i mean i don't know if the, if there's um if if hotspots like hotspot residue that really directly contribute to binding, or really the on what's the only like important contribution, or if there is, there are uh, mm -hmm. residues that 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 would just like destabilize perhaps the that folded the 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 the, the, the free destructure of the folded peptide states that would also contribute to to the binding. Ah, okay, that is a very interesting question. I can't answer it with the with the approach that we used because mm -hmm. we looked at the interface residues and we keep kept everything fixed mm -hmm. but that's definitely a question that i want to ask i haven't i don't have data about this yet you yeah. know the question is of how do la i have a little bit of data in this example of the firm domain where this like the three a and the three b site are at the other at different sites of the beta sheet and when i change when i bind something in three a i can see that three b closes mm -hmm. but i don't know why I do the simulations and I can see that there is a closure, but I haven't been able to see, you know, what actually leads to this. I haven't done the, the analysis properly. Mm -hmm. I need to do this more. I think that you're right. This is one thing that we really need to look at because we don't understand this to the end. Yeah, I, I was always thinking exactly along the same line, saying that, you know, if you could take your motifs and change one residue at a time, and see, you know, what happens from the binding uh, uh, binding point of view, and from the uh, local structure point of view, what are you changing? I mean, are you changing? Are you changing both? Are you changing the local structure more? I don't know if that is doable, but I think it could be a way of of looking at it to see what what at what point, you know, what residue, what you know, what you have a motif, and some motifs, you know, will be doing something different and and whether you can you can separate the two the binding you know the 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 hotspot yeah. binding and and the local structure i think that related because in a way you get 
see if you want the peptide will adopt the local structure that is kind of selected for to bind you know whatever it needs to bind you know evolutionary so they are both linked so it would be just interesting to know if these two uh, always correlate yeah. so the only thing that i can say the only thing that we are really doing now that is somehow related to this is from a completely different region, uh, the, um, direction we are working on looking at if natural language embedding, embeddings, if you do mutations, if you can see non-local effects. So mm -hmm. we are looking at this in the sense in, on a very different, you know, on, on, on cancer mutations to see, you know, if you can identify um, non-local effects using these types of embeddings, which would basically translate into something that we need to map onto the structure. But we haven't done this on the structure properly yet. So this is only very, very, very initial thing. So we need to think more about this. We, we, are, not, we are not very far yet with that. But for, for your allosteric you know, structure, allosteric effect, yeah. you should be sampling both conformations, the ones that bind and don't, yes. at, different, at different populations. And in the presence of you know, one of the peptides, you are basically stabilizing a form that's actually not yes. otherwise. Remember, right. you know, remember our allosteric thing. Yeah, I know, I remember. The binding, remember. the binding is really pulling down in terms of energy. Some, yes. you know, a, a conformation which is actually not highly populated, at, you know, independently. Yes. So we see so, that we do see that we do see that when we add the peptide on the other side, we sample more close conformations. Yeah. Um, in terms of energy. I don't remember, we didn't look at the energy because yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it's, that. yeah. If you we sample do, more local conformation, it means that you sample, you know, the, the energy of the log of the closed conformation is lowered. That's all. Right. I think this is true. I'm not sure how quantitative our simulations are, but yeah. qualitatively, definitely. <laughs> we, we can see that when we use a relaxed protocol with and without the peptide, and, and also what we can also do we can start a simulation from the bound conformation and from the unbound conformation. And then we can see where it goes. So you take yeah. the bound conformation, you remove the peptide, and then you see that it moves immediately to the unbound conformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we start from the unbound conformation, we add the peptide and we refine it, it opens back again. Mm -hmm. But quant, quant, I'm not sure how much quantitative data I can get from this. I can, you know, I can tell you the energies of the final structures, but I don't think this is enough. Yeah, but you know, in principle, you know, in, in in absence of any of the peptide, the two conformations have to be sampled, but at very yes. different populations. That's yes. that's all there and is. And, and, and you know, and then if you change, you can actually play with the con the concentration of the peptides. You know, to you know to do if you could play in in vivo, or, you know, or not in vivo, but in, in in your test tube, if you could, you could play the pe peptide concentrations, you could actually move things differently. Yes, we see that. Actually, we have the experiments and we see that mm -hmm. the more peptide we add that binds to the first site, the less peptide we bind, binding we have. It basically it outcompetes. Right. But it's much more complex than that because we don't yeah. know yet if the second peptide doesn't also bind the first site. We, we are not... be, it could be an intermediate situation where, where you know, it's enough of binding affinity is, is for some intermediate structure that that could bind both. <laughs> exactly. So we, we don't know yet. Okay. Great. It's really nice. Thank you. Wonderful. And and do you think you can you can extend you know this uh, sampling you know using using the patches and and the the monomer complementarity of of the environment? Could you extend this to protein drug interactions? In other words, finding interactions that you, know, you take a patch and you see what's around it and say, okay, you know, it looks like I can fit a small molecule in there. I can use, you know, the hotspots or something in, in, and then say, okay, this is what I have to match with a small molecule. Could you do that? Yeah, could, we were thinking about think it this. would be possible? We were thinking, I mean, the most trivial thing to do, and this, this has been done, for example, Dima has done this, to just look at the patches and to find uh, other proteins that bind small molecules with a similar patch. Yeah, it's right, okay. That's, that's one thing, thing. That, yes, that's very sure. trivial. But then you can also look at what happens in this patch, what is there. The point here is that we are 
there is one very big difference. So, for example, in com 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 comparison, to, for example, to MASIF or to um, protocols that have been de developed to look at the surface, we are not mm -hmm. looking at the surface here at all. We are looking at the backbone. Right, right, so right. Our, yeah, right. Uh, right, our idea right. is to look only at the backbone because what we yeah, say is that's that not that enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so the reason why we want to look only at the backbone is because then we get a very large sample. We know that only a yeah. subset will be relevant. You want to, and you want to sample very widely, you know. Yes. But widely exactly. enough so that you can you know you can catch you can catch the rare bird and then i can also go into different directions i can yeah, have yeah. an interaction that i can change you know by yeah. by changing the sequence i can change what finds but yeah. i have like this common ground that i can play mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the idea mm -hmm. no it's it's a great it's a great you know improvement nice. learn learn from what's there yeah but know how to look where to look <laughs> <laughs> nice any more questions from anyone? Thomas. Ah, uh, Thomas. It, it, yes, it, it, I, I have been... one. Um, when, when you are saying that you 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 are able to learn from from monomeric structures because peptides follow the same uh, interaction trends, don't you think that you can maybe also learn from um, higher oligomers that form tight contacts with their other copies? Let's say homo oligomers. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely, definitely. So that should be in the data set. Basically, ah, okay. you, if you have uh, uh, the data, what I was surprised is that we're using this data set from 2014 that has very few structures and the, the, the coverage is really high. But we also saw now, we now generated a new database that has more structures. You can get much more if you have more, more, more structures. And actually, it, you are right, we could basically also use crystal contacts. We could do, use all yeah, the yeah. operations. Yeah. Right? You yeah, that's what I one. thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then we might get weak interactions. But yeah, we, we, we should do that. We haven't done that. Or just the hetero complexes that are that form right. like very tight complexes, but they bind with a continuous segment. Right, right. That yeah, I mean the that number of, of hetero complexes with just a peptide actually, you know, that really makes makes the interface. Yeah, exactly. Right. Have been studied before. Yeah. Yeah, but that would be like homology modeling, more type of homology modeling. Yeah. Yeah. Homology. Point is that we that we want to show that it's not only homology modeling. No, I mean I'm I'm very happy with homology modeling too. <laughs> that is just you know an extension to it. Yeah. Looking yeah. for homology in, in different places. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Great. Really nice. Well, that was very very nice. So many good questions. Thanks a lot.